Good morning. How's everyone doing in the house of the Lord? Doing good? Yes. It's a good day to be alive. It's a beautiful day. Uh, we had a request come in via telephone, which I've never had before in 48 years of existence, but it's Brother Ed's birthday coming up this week. So happy birthday, Brother Ed. And you know, we, I guess it's just KCOG's thing. We just sing happy birthday to everybody, right? So can we sing to Brother Ed today? Anybody else got a birthday coming up next week? No? All right. Well, let's all stand. We got to get our vocalizers warmed up for worship. So this will be our warm-up this morning, okay? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. May God bless and keep you. Happy birthday to you. I, I only make the young kids come up on stage and embarrass them. We love you, Brother Ed. Let's all sing this morning. Hallelujah. Come on. I was lost in shame, could not get past my pain until he called my name. I'm so glad he changed me, darkness held me down, but Jesus pulled me out. I'm no longer bound. I'm so glad he changed me. See, I'm now a new creation. Yes, he's mine. Sin had left me blind, but Jesus opened my eyes. Now I see the light. I'm so glad he changed me. Now I'm walking free. I beat the victory. It's all over me. I'm so glad he changed me. The old is gone. I live by faith, by faith, not by sight. Everybody say there is a new day, it's a new glory, and it's mine. Yes, it's mine. I met Jesus, I met the author of my story, and it's mine. Yes, it's mine. There is a new Yes, it's mine. I met Jesus. I met the author of my story. And he's mine. Yes, he's mine. Come on, sir. I am who I am because the I am tells me who I am. I am who I am because the I am tells me who I am. I am who I am because the I am. Yes, it's mine. I met Jesus. I met the author of my story. And he's mine. Yes, he's mine. There is a new name. Down in glory. And it's mine. Yes, it's mine. Hallelujah. I met the author of my story. And he's mine. Yes, he's mine. Yes, he's mine, and he's mine, yes, he's mine, yeah. hallelujah, I love that, you got your name written down in glory today, 
If you don't, today could be your day, amen? Hallelujah. Because the greatest miracle is what? Salvation, amen? Let's sing about it today. Let faith arise In spite of what I see, Lord, I believe But help my unbelief, I choose to trust you No matter what I feel, let faith arise Let faith arise for my champion's not dead, he is alive And he already knows my every need Surely he will come and rescue me God of miracles come You're the God of miracles. Lord, let faith arise in this place today, Jesus. There's two or three gathered here in your name. And we want to see your kingdom come today, God. Let faith arise. And see the kingdom come, I live. For the battle has been won, my God is faithful. In every single word he said is true. Oh, God of miracles, come. We need your supernatural love to break. Nothing's impossible You're the God of miracles I love this This world is shaking But you cannot be shaken My heart is breaking But I'm not broken yet Your love is fearless Help me
Just lift your hands and worship him in this place. If you believe that this morning, Lord, thank you, Jesus, as it is in heaven. Father, let it be on this earth today in this sanctuary. Let your people's faith arise. Let our praise and worship arise to you today, Jesus. You're almighty. You're all powerful. No one is above you today, Jesus. We worship your name today, Father. Change this atmosphere today, God. For you and you alone. Fall fresh, 
church worship him this morning he's here he's here your love surrounds us oh feel this place Jesus feel this place Lord with your spirit oh your love surrounds us yes it does Just lift your hands right now. Give honor to the presence of the Spirit of God that surrounds us. Let's not rush through. Let's not take this moment for granted. But right now, just bask in His presence. Thank Him for His presence. Thank Him that the atmosphere has been changed by his power, by his presence. We are standing on holy ground. And I know that there are angels all around. He has angels that camp round about those that fear him, that love him.
come on, sing it again. Worship Him as you sing. Oh, we are Don't you feel him? And I know, yes, I know that there are angels and they're all around. So let us praise, let us praise, let us pray. Come on, praise him. Jesus now. softly for a moment I don't want to get ahead of the spirit of God and what he wants to do Wednesday night when Pastor Terry or Carrie was teaching she, at the end of her teaching he, she had us all to sing an old song that says I surrender all I surrender all an old analogy that I've used before years gone by has been that if if you're out walking the sidewalk or the streets of your town or your city, and somebody comes up behind you and they put a cold barrel in your back, and you know it's not their finger, and they said, get your hands up. I want everything you've got. Empty your pockets. You'll first do what they said. You'll comply. And you'll surrender. You'll surrender with hands raised high. And you won't take them down until that person is gone or you've emptied your pockets one or the other. As I look out on this congregation today, for whatever reason, maybe you have a really good physical reason that you can't raise your hands in worship. But you know, there's a reason why we do many things in worship, why we clap our hands why we lift our hands, why we shout out loud, why we sing aloud, why we may dance before God. There's biblical reasons for the expressions of our praise and worship. And one of those is that sign of universal surrender, hands raised high and saying, God, I surrender all to you that are in this place, to the one that is in this place, to your presence on holy ground. Thank you, Lord. For you are in this place, here on holy ground. Come on, worship him now. Oh, yes, we are standing right here on holy. This is not just a building. It's been dedicated to the glory of God. up high in the air. Hallelujah. Surrender all to him right now in the name of Jesus. In his presence on a holy ground. One more time. One more time. God's given breakthrough. Yes, we are standing. Hallelujah. On a holy ground. Just touch somebody and pray for him right now. In the name of Jesus, and I know that there are angels all around. They're visiting Kincaid, Illinois right now today. So let us praise, let us praise, let us praise King Jesus now. Yes, we are. 
Yes, we are standing in His presence. Oh, we are standing in His presence on holy ground. Right now, just continue to pray for that one that you may be praying for. If you've laid your hands on somebody's shoulder right now, don't stop. Don't stop now. We talked about that last week. Don't stop now. Don't stop praying now for that one that you're praying for. In the name of Jesus, Lord, whether it's for salvation, whether it's for healing of the body, healing of the soul, healing of the body, healing of the mind, God, touch your people today. Touch your people today. In the name of Jesus, get a hold of your people today. In the name of Jesus, help them to know this may be the only time we have. This You could come today, this afternoon, or, or next week, God. We don't know. No man knows the day or the hour, not even the angels of heaven, only the Father. But God, we need your touch. We need your spirit, God. As it is in heaven, let it be on earth a touch of your spirit, a touch of your presence in a great measure. Oh, God. Oh, God. Turn to somebody and say, you can't purchase this presence with gold or silver. Mm. This precious presence of God can't be bought, but it can be sought. Right now we seek. Jesus said, ask, and it shall be given. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and the door will be opened unto you. I feel like there's just some people that can't get free this morning. You just, you're just holding back what you feel inside of you, and you're just holding it back for whatever reason. God knows the reason, and you know the reason. But you just need to have liberty. God's already given us the liberty because he said in his word, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. There is freedom to worship God in spirit and in truth. Where the spirit of the Lord is, does anybody sense the Spirit of the Lord here today, huh? Does anybody sense the presence of God here today? Then he's already granted you the liberty and the freedom to worship unabated. Without inhibitions. Father, today, mm, we thank you for your sweet, sweet, sweet presence in this place. And for the rest of this service as well, let us push aside everything that would try to cloud our thoughts and misplace our focus upon you, Lord Jesus. What you have to say, what you want to do because this service is yours. It's yours. Right now, just lift up your hands and say, Lord, minister to that one that I've been praying for. Minister to that one relative. Oh, God. Oh, God. I understand maybe you don't want to say their name too loud maybe you don't want others to know around about you who it is that's really on your heart but just go ahead and tell the Lord right now talk to him like nobody else is around you and lift up that one in prayer in the name of Jesus
there's um, some of your friends, some of your loved ones, as with me as well, that right now they're on the run. They're on the run from God. And we need to pray that the Holy Spirit will simply just track them down. And touch them and help them to know it's time to either get right or get back to being right. It's time to get back to the Father's house. Or it's time to start attending the Father's house, wherever that may be. Lord, we pray for those that are running today and that their course will change and they will not run away from you but run into your arms. This world has absolutely nothing to offer other than that which is temporal, but you offer that which is eternal. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Turn to somebody and Greet them one more time as you're seated in the presence of the Lord as our ushers come today. And we're going to worship the Lord in the tithe and in our offerings. God, we worship you with that which you've blessed us with. We give back, Lord, unto you. We want to walk in obedience, live in obedience. Not just now, but all the time. And right now, during this time of worship, we pray your blessings upon the gifts upon the tithe, upon the offerings. Everything already belongs to you. And bless your people. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you as you worship. want to make a few announcements this morning, and we welcome all of you that are here in the building today, worshiping the King of Glory, and we welcome those of you that are watching online, and we pray God would bless you and touch you right there in your home or wherever you may be. He will touch you and minister to you. And uh, if you're watching online, if you'd please just click the like and the share comment buttons, and that will help us get the gospel of Jesus Christ to people that's on your friend list and, and uh, family that's on your friend list on good old Facebook. Facebook. There's so much on Facebook. The good, the bad, and the ugly, <laughs> right? The drama and the drama and the drama many times on Facebook. But we can all turn it in for, and, and those pages into something that it should be 
for the good and for the glory of God. And even though we've got Facebook, I'm so glad that the faith book came a long time ago. And we have the faith book. I tell you what, our churches would be much stronger today if less people or more people would spend less time on Facebook and more time in the faith book. Oh, but I use my phone for the faith book. I know, I know. Sometimes I do too. But I also know what kind of distractions can come along with that. You might be look, looking at scriptures and stuff on Facebook or Facebook on your phone, then all of a sudden there's a message comes in and you hear it go ding, your notification goes off, and you just got to get away from reading the scripture and check out what was that text message or what was this phone call or what was this voicemail. It doesn't happen with this. If somehow we could ever just put this away into another room, And I'm going to put a challenge out to everybody here, every family member that's here. This Thanksgiving, a week from this Thursday, don't bring this to the table. Let's just talk. Let's have FaceTime without Facebook. All right? You take the challenge, say amen. That was pretty weak. You take the challenge, say amen. See how addicted we are to it. We can't even just give a hearty amen. I'll do that, Pastor. I'll do that. Maybe only one time, but I'll, well, I'm, I'm, I'm not asking for every Sunday or every Thursday, just this one Thursday a week from this Thursday. <laughs> Praise God. Senior ministry uh, this week, Tuesday, 10 a.m., Taylorville Estates. And also at uh, the Taylorville Care. And then I believe there's lunch afterwards. And uh, then there's a community service, a Thanksgiving service, Saturday the 23rd at 6 p.m. at the Midland United Methodist Church. And then the men's ministry announcement is the chili and soup cook-off next Sunday. Please sign up, men, if you haven't already done that. So I'm going to get involved in that this year. And... Uh, See what happens. I'm doing soup, though, not chili. I'm doing soup. Lord willing. And uh, so that'll be a good time of fellowship, and it's also a fundraiser that the men have. And then we also have personalized church devotionals that are out in the foyer. Uh, picked one up all ago. Picked one up. They're personalized, very nice. And you can use those for your devotions uh, coming up. Uh, does that start actually January 1 in that book? December? Okay. So they start actually in December. So be sure you get your copy and take one for someone else. Yes, that's good. Take one for somebody else. So apparently you've got several. Okay. They've got several of those, so please be sure you get yours as well. At this time, we want to dismiss the, uh, the children to Children's Church. Would you come? Don't be shy. Don't be shy. Come on, children. Got to fix some tread wear there. <laughs> right over here. Nobody's got to come on. She does. I see shoes that are lighting up. And she walked. I was with my dad, my father-in-law, my wife's dad at the doctor's in Petersburg this past week. And I have some new slip-on sketcher shoes that you don't have to use a shoehorn with. You just stick your, stick your foot in and go. And I'm looking down at my left one and they got these little tiny holes about four, three or four in a row. And I'm looking down at my left one and there was a light inside of my shoe. And I'm looking at the other one and there's no light inside of that shoe. I looked over again. There's a pretty green light, real small. It's only about a sixteenth of an inch in diameter. And I'm looking down, and I see that light. And I thought, what in the world? So I had my wife lean over and said, take a look at this. There's a light inside right there. It's about the toe of my shoe in the front, right in the center. She looked down, and she, well, there sure is. So I took my shoe off, and I handed it to her to give to her dad. And he looked at it, and he had to move it around a little bit. And she said, well, sure enough, there is, but there wasn't in the other. You know what? If they had have not seen that, there was a lady sitting across from us that we didn't know, and I was going to ask her to take a look. 
But I didn't have to because they both confirmed what I was seeing. And so when they gave me my shoe back, I thought, what in the world is that? I don't believe this. It's actually a, a light. It's, it's glowing. And I know I don't have battery-operated shoes or anything like that. And so I took my hand and ran in there, and I felt something right around where that spot's at inside. And it felt like a bump. And so I just kind of rubbed that a little bit, put my shoe back on, and the light went away. I should have just left well enough alone and not stuck my hand inside my shoe and left the light there because I liked it. It was kind of neat. It was the green light to walk. Stretch your hands to our young people. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray for our young people today, God, as they go from uh, the sanctuary down to Children's Church. We ask, God, that you would touch their leaders today, Lord God, that you would give them a fresh word from your word into their hearts and lives, one that they will be able to understand and take with them from this day forward. Bless them, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Give them a good God bless you as they go to Children's Church today. All right, if you have your Bibles, open your Bible up. But I'm not going to tell you where to go to yet. Well, I will give you just a little, little help. Go to John's Gospel, first of all, in your Bible, and just uh, put your ribbon there or however you mark a page in your Bible. Just put something there, put your finger there. And hold that spot in John, just the Gospel of John. Or if you don't have um, anything like that, maybe you want to use your neighbor's finger, put their finger there and hold it there in that spot as well. <laughs> this morning I want to uh, minister a few minutes. <clears throat> I have one message that uh, I was working on for today and then... Uh, it just, it was coming together, but it wasn't coming together, and I spent like three or four hours, and and then God just rearranged things, changed things. And so today, uh, I want to talk about the simplicity of salvation, the simplicity of salvation, which if I'm going to preach on the simplicity of salvation, it's also going to be probably pretty simple, all right, and, but that's okay, and scripture bears forth that that's okay, um, we like to go deep, um, but there may be somebody here that just needs to know about the simplicity of salvation today, and as we get into this, uh, some 134 years ago, Charles H. Spurgeon preached a message titled, The Simplicity and Sublimity of Salvation. And he used for his text, John 1, 11 through 13. Now you can go there, John 1, 11 through 13. See, I didn't want you reading it ahead of just that little bit of a, an intro about Charles Spurgeon and what he was preaching, and this is the text that he used 134 years ago or around 1890. And here is the text in the King James Version. He came unto his own, talking about Jesus, and his own received him not, or basically the Jewish people. Uh, but as many as received him, because to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God, or born of God, or born from above. <clears throat> and we know that the Samaritans didn't have anything to do with the Jewish people, vice versa, and they were like unclean, and they were like dogs in their side and all of that, but there were some people that Jesus met when he was doing his earthly ministry that weren't Jewish, they were Samaritans, and he ministered to them, and he loved them. And one particular woman at a well, uh, he read her mail, and you know the story, and that whenever thing was said and done and he had forgiven her, he said, I don't condemn thee either, but go and sin no more. And so even before Pentecost and even before uh, the gospel and the Holy Spirit was poured out upon the Gentiles, uh, in the book of Acts, we find that Jesus loved everybody. 
and Jesus ministered to others as well. But Spurgeon said, and I quote, and we have this quote on the screen this morning. This is from Spurgeon about this particular verse. Everything here is simple. Everything is sublime. Here is that simple gospel by which the most ignorant may be saved. Here are profundities in which the best instructed may find themselves beyond their depth. Here are those everlasting hills of divine truth which man cannot climb. Yet here is that plain path in which the wayfaring man, though a fool, need not err nor lose his way. That is quite a statement. And, of course, Charles Spurgeon has a lot of those wonderful, wonderful nuggets. Over in John 3:16 through verse 18, a very familiar, familiar portion of Scripture that we could probably all quote, and all of my Scriptures today are from the King James Version. Is that all right? Is that okay? I mean, I grew up with the King James Version, and my parents did, and if it was good enough for them, it's good enough for me. But I do like the fact that we have the new King James Version that takes the... King James English out of there so you don't get tripped on, tripped up on some of those these and thous and thuses and whatever. And if we come across those and I need to feel like I need to explain what that means, I can do that. But uh, we have New King James. We have the uh, ESV version. We have the NIV version and, and a lot of wonderful, uh, wonderful translations. But uh, John 3.16 uh, through verse 18, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And remember, believing is not a one-time boom and it's done. That's why the ETH is on the end there in the King James English, believeth that you continue to believe. You don't believe and just stop, but you continue to go on and believe day after day. And then he says in verse 17, Jesus said, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And he that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Now, first of all, let me, let me say this, that there was two gardens in the Bible. And the reason this is so important, and the reason, like Brent said earlier, that salvation is the greatest miracle, the reason this is so important is because in the first garden, where the first Adam was at, he sinned against God. And I don't have time to go back to the scripture, and ladies, this is just the way, the way it is. So don't get mad at the messenger. But the Bible clearly says that Adam was not the one deceived in the garden. Eve was the one that was beguiled. She was the one that was deceived by the serpent when he came to her and said, look at this fruit. Doesn't that look good? And you know the story. And she took and ate. But when Adam came along, the serpent was not around at the time and he loved Eve so very much and she began to talk to him about the fruit and the story as it goes she offered to Adam and he did partake and he did eat. I remember one time there was a message entitled the influence of a woman and they can be influential in many 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 good ways. But through scripture, there's also some women that were influential in bad ways, just like men, though. So I'm not just coming down on women here. Just to tell you what's very important about this thing of salvation today. So that is in the first garden where man fell. The first Adam fell. But in the second garden, later on in the New Testament, called the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus, who's known as the second Adam, knelt there and prayed earnestly three times until his sweat became as great drops of blood that if there be any way that this cup of suffering and going to the cross would pass for him. But he said, not my will be done, Father, but yours which is in heaven. Your will be done. 
And so that second Adam, which knelt there, almost perhaps falling to the ground with weakness as the disciples couldn't stay awake with him and watch and pray, and as he was maybe falling forward even because he was weak and his sweat became, becoming as great drops of blood, Jesus, the second Adam, prayed the prayer three times earnestly, and then guess what? Jesus, the second Adam, got up. Jesus, Adam, the first the first Adam fell, but Jesus, the second Adam, got up. And he went on and was arrested. And you know the story of, of the trial, the mockery and everything that went on and his crucifixion, his death, his burial, and praise God, his resurrection. And probably the most, the well, the most well-known Bible verse throughout the world is the one we just read, John 3.16. It's simple enough for a child to understand, yet it is so rich, yet so sublime that theologians and pastors struggle to fully communicate the depths of God's love contained in this one small verse, John 3.16. And of course, verse 17 and 18 are very important behind that, but verse 16 is and specifically there. Um, how God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I'm going to say more about that believing in him perhaps a little bit later on. In 1 Corinthians 15, through through 4, the apostle Paul said, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to what? The scriptures. That's what, it, that's what the Bible teaches. That's what the Bible says. And this is what the Apostle Paul is delivering unto them at the church at Corinth. Now, you do not have to be a genius in order to know how to live for God. And I'm so glad. I've never had an IQ test, but I know one thing for sure. I never would reach the genius level. Anybody with me here today? I know you, some of you are smart people. Now, if you didn't raise your hand, I'm thinking, hmm, maybe they did, did reach the genius level. Maybe you're just not being honest enough. I'm just, anybody reach the genius level? Raise your hand. No. Oh. <laughs> I think I tripped him up on that question. Maybe not. Maybe he is genius. <laughs> But, but anyhow, you don't have to be a genius in order to know how to live for God. Serving God is simple. Living for Jesus is simple. I'm not saying that a person can do it successfully in their own flesh or their own energy of the flesh. I'm just saying that it isn't that complicated. If you want to be a growing Christian, if you want to stay close to the Lord, if you want to grow spiritually, just maintain some regular habits. How many of you got some habits? It's time for truth or consequences. How many of you got some regular habits? Sure. How many of you got some now? Are you ready for this one? How many of you got some kind of not so good regular habits? Whatever that may be. Your wife may look at you and you're doing something that's a habit. She may say, would you stop that? Or you as a husband may look at your wife and she's got some sort of a habit and would you stop that? I'll just tell on us. In part. I'll tell you what my wife's one habit is. And she's had it for a long, long time. Actually, there's two. And it both involves typically the kitchen. She opens a cabinet door, and that's where it stays, open. And then I come through, and I don't see it, and I bump my head. Not just where we're at, because it's a small place, anywhere we've ever lived, in a larger house or whatever. She opens that cabinet door. She gets something. She goes about doing her business. I come around. I see the cabinet door, and I... Close it up. Or another one that deals with the kitchen is she's like one of her grandmothers, and she has this wet dish rag, this damp dish rag all the time. So it's there, you know, laying across the sink, and, and she just feels like she needs to wipe and swipe on the counter one more time. That she, like, didn't get it clean the first time. My wife can clean like nobody's business, but she, like, just wipes it once again. I come around, and I decide I need to lean on the cabinet. So I lean on the cabinet, and I go, so I grow up to paper towel or, or dish towel, and I come back, and I wipe down and, and dry it off. 
And I'll kid you not, sometimes, not every time, sometimes, a few minutes later, I'll come back to the kitchen and I'll come in there for something and I'll put my hand on the counter and I'll say, it's wet again. I just dried it. I said, God, we got a leak in the ceiling or what? No, that's just my lovely wife wiping in a swiping. Yeah, I'm not going to get into my habits. (laughs) Well, just for particular reasons, okay, I'm just not going to go there. <laughs> but uh, we, we all have different habits, but we need to maintain some really good regular habits when it comes to being a Christian and growing spiritually. One of those is to read the Bible. I hope nobody coughs or chokes on this, but we need to re- read the Bible every day. I don't want to meddle. I want to preach. Whether you think this is meddling or whether you think it's preaching, I guess you can decide. But again, do we pick this up near enough? And I don't mean we pick it up to move it to dust. I mean, do we pick this word up and open up and read just a few verses from the Psalms? Or get a chart. If you're going through something, look on that chart and say, this is a scripture I need to read because this is what I'm going through. And turn to the pages there and read that. Do we do that as much as we pick up this? Or if this was the remote control to the TV, this? And we all have a, a, an app there on our phone somewhere that tells you how much time you use the phone in a day, how much time of that is on Facebook, how, of it's, how much of it's on text messaging and all of that. And you'd be surprised how it adds up really quick and how this doesn't quite add up to that many words read or verses read or chapters read. I'm glad a few of you be able to say amen there. Well, it's either amen or oh me. Let's be honest. It's either amen or oh me. This is going to pass away. Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word shall not pass away. And guess what? We're going to be judged according to the word. How about this habit? Make it a habit to pray every day. Not just read the Bible and study the Bible, but also pray every day. And I'm not saying you've got to pray for an hour or two hours. But pray a few minutes here and a few minutes there and, and find some real quiet time where you maybe put 10 or 15 minutes in prayer, 30 minutes. That'd be wonderful for a lot of people. You know, just five minutes would be wonderful for a lot of people. Or we'll also add in the times when you're just driving in your car listening to Christian music. Now, it's going to be kind of hard to do this if you're listening to country music. It's going to be hard to really seek the Lord and call upon him when you're hearing somebody in the background singing about whatever in country music. And there is a lot of whatever in country music. And I know some of you probably like country music. I do too. Country gospel music, southern gospel music. I left country music alone a long time ago when I worked in construction and all I ever heard when I went to work on that little radio that my cousin would play every day was honky-tonk music, country music. This bar and that bar, sleeping here and sleeping there, just all the kind of stuff that was back then. And if it was back then in the 70s, it's even far worse today. Kind of hard to pray when you got that going on. But you need to be like the scripture says, praying without ceasing. In other words, being an attitude of prayer as you drive your car. You might really want to up that a little bit because there's a lot of drivers out there that don't really know how to drive too well, right? And we're we're in the hunting season time of the year and deer are running around everywhere. You got to watch out for them. Red eyes as well, you know. One guy might have red eyes because he's been drinking. But the deer has red eyes because that's just the way they are when the lights hit them at night. Be careful. Pray. Talk to someone about the Lord every day. Now, for some people, that may be a little hard because you may be at home by yourself most of the day and don't ever ever see anybody. But be willing to um, use what we call prophetic evangelism every day when you're out and about. And if you see somebody, just give them a prophetic word of evangelism, which could be simply this. Do you know God loves you today? 
God bless you, and you go away. It could be more, it could be deeper than that. It could be something that God's uh, talking to your spirit about that you need to give them a certain word um, and just be sensitive to the spirit of God. Find the right church and attend it every time the doors are open. Yes, Lord, it's getting quiet in here. <laughs> Give tithes and offerings from your income every Sunday or whenever you typically give. We can do that now here. We can do it online, you know, different ways to do it. Try to put into practice what you hear and preach from the word of God. Follow the leadership and example of your pastor. And we pray for Pastor Vance today. I mean, they're about, what, 10 hours ahead of us, but we pray for him. And it is getting nighttime, you know, but he's already had a day of ministry at two different places. Let's pray for his strength and pray for God to touch him and continue to, to use him for God's glory. And I promise you that if you'll do these things, you'll grow in the Lord. It's that simple. I didn't say you won't have problems. I didn't say you wouldn't have difficulties because the Lord said that in this world you're going to have troubles, you're going to have tribulations, but be of good cheer for I have overcome them. Many are the afflictions. Many are, the not a few, but many are the afflictions of the righteous, but my God shall deliver them out of them all. Can you say amen? But it is impossible to grow as a Christian until you first become a Christian. So that needs to be settled first through the simplicity of the gospel. If you had to describe someone um, about a simple life and how their life was simple, what would you say? Would you say that they had a garden where all their food came from and they didn't need to go to the grocery store and that's simple? Perhaps they had no need of a car and the entire headache that comes with that. You know, my mom lived to be 83 years old. She never drove a day in her life. <laughs> and all the women went, oh! you can't imagine that, can you? But she didn't. She never got her driver's license. It wasn't because dad didn't want her to. She just never had a desire to drive. She never drove a day in her life. If she had, if I'd have been going, oh! Perhaps the simple life means the person has everything they need and nothing more. What is the simple life? If you're a person who lives in today's world, how do you have a life that could be described as simple? Because our culture is one that lacks the inward and outward reality of simplicity. Our world is very complicated. One of the basic needs we have in this world is security. Our culture tells us that we should trust in things to provide us with security. Our culture tells us that we should trust in money and influence for security. Our culture tells us that the only newest and best will provide the comfort and security we need. In our, in our quest for security, we lose touch with reality and simplicity. Now, when the world says to us or the culture says to us we need the newest and the best, I like to have new things, you like to have new things, that's just kind of the way we're wired. But some of the old things are good too, right? I hope somebody can say amen to that because you've got a 70-year-old preaching to you right now. <laughs> I'm not as spry as I was when I started at 25. And I sweat a whole lot more. <laughs> we crave things we neither need nor enjoy many times. We buy things we don't want to impress people we don't like. We are ashamed if we drive a car until it wears out. I guess that was my problem. <laughs> there was a habit. There's a bad habit. I hadn't thought of that until just now, but I have had too many cars over my lifetime. And I've only had a couple or three that's been paid off. And one, one of them's out there in the parking lot right now, thank God. But I'm telling you, Some of you know what I'm talking about today, especially you men. Yeah. We feel that to be out of step with fashion is to be weird. Where do I want to go with that? Well, fashion is okay for men and women as long as there's enough material that it covers up the nakedness of men and women. 
You women thought I was just going to talk about you. But I've seen some men out in public that they need some help. They need some common sense. (laughs) So don't feel weird. Don't feel weird because you're wearing something that maybe is not like the fashion of the day because the fashion of the day might not be in line with the glory of God. You can tell when preachers are preaching because it gets quiet. Covetousness and greed is called ambition today instead of sin. Yeah, in our culture. People are important based on how much they produce or how much they earn in our culture today. We're talking about the simplicity of salvation. We're talking about lives now that are simple or living simplistic lives. The greatest stumbling block to those who desire a relationship with God comes from the fact that the gospel is so simple. Many other religions, they've got to do this and they've got to do that and they've got to do a whole lot more of this and a whole lot more of that in order to please their God, small g, they got to knock on so many doors to please their small g. They got to be a certain uh, group in order to enter heaven of around 144,000. If you're outside of that group, you don't get to go. There are these different cults in religion, and we have them right here in America. We tend to want to do something. People want to do something to earn salvation. God says it's a gift because Jesus Christ paid the price on the cross and he bought eternal life for every man as we read in John 3.16. I got eight things I want to cover real quick here about the simplicity of salvation. First of all, salvation is as simple as coming when you are called. And these scriptures won't be on the screen, just the points, one, two, three, through eight. Uh, so the scripture is Matthew eleven twenty eight. Come unto me, Jesus said, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come unto me. In other words, we need to come when we are called. And if God's calling you today, you need to come. In just a moment, we'll give you an opportunity to come. If you haven't already prayed a prayer for salvation, we'll give you an opportunity to do that. But we need to come whenever it is that we are called. And when I go through these eight things, you're going to look at them and you're going to think, wow, it's that simple, it's that simple, it's that simple. But I don't want you to look at these, some of these things especially, I don't want you, this one is what it is, it is what it is. But I don't want you to look at some of these things thinking in the terms of the flesh. I don't want you to think in the terms of, well, this is just a natural thing because here's what Jesus has done in the scriptures. When he spoke in parables and he told a story, he would use natural things to convey a spiritual reality. And so some of these things are going to deal with natural things, but it's also very, very spiritual in our receiving salvation and understanding the simplicity of salvation. Number two, salvation, here's one of those, is as simple as drinking water. John 4, 14, remember in the spirit now. But whosoever drinketh continues to drink of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up unto or into everlasting life. The water the water of the word, the washing of the water of the word by the word of God. John 7, 37 through 38, in the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried saying, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. Come unto Jesus and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. That he's speaking in reference to the Holy Spirit that is in you, flowing through you and out of you. Number three, salvation is as simple as eating bread. John 6, 35, Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. John 6, 51, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life 
of the wor- for the life of the world. You see, it's like when we receive communion, we take that element, the wafer, the bread, and we recognize that as a symbol of the body of Jesus Christ. And when we take that cup of the juice, we recognize that's a symbol of the blood shed of Jesus Christ. Symbols. And Jesus is using these natural things in reference to the spiritual aspect of how that he is like the, the bread and how he's like the water. And number four, salvation is as simple as entering a door. John 10, 9 through 10, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved, and he shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy, but I am come that they may have life and they might have it more abundantly. Amen. Number five, salvation is as simple as receiving a gift. Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Aren't you glad it's a gift? Now, some people have a problem receiving a gift. For a long time when we first went into the ministry, I had a little struggle with that. My wife's had a struggle with receiving gifts. But when you think about what it means to that person that is giving you the gift, we shouldn't struggle with that because they, they want to be blessed and they realize that God's leading them to, to be a, a blessing to somebody else, either in the church here or outside of the church somewhere. But don't, don't be like that and don't, don't, don't feel like I cannot. You know, oh, I'll take it, but I don't want to take it. Uh, just reach out and receive the gift that is being given because it's a blessing to the giver. Just like it became a real blessing to the Lord Jesus Christ, even though he knew what he was going to suffer on the cross of Calvary, he endured the, 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 the shame. He endured the cross because he knew that it was going to bring many sons and daughters into the kingdom of God. And that's why the nails couldn't hold him there. That's why the soldiers couldn't keep him there. It was his love for lost humanity that kept Jesus Christ hanging upon that tree tree until the ghost left him, until his spirit was gone. And he cried out, it's finished. And he gave up the spirit. Number six, salvation is as simple as calling for help. Boy, you look at that in the natural, sometimes it's not too simple. You get in some trouble and you need to call the police, and you call 911, it may take them a few minutes to get there. It may take them five or ten minutes to get there, depending on where they're at and where you're at and all the different things and weather and all that. But when you call out for Jesus for help, he doesn't have to worry about the weather. He doesn't have to worry about a certain ETA. He doesn't have to hop in a squad car or an ambulance or a fire truck because he said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. He's just as close as the mention of his name. How many got up this morning calling his name? I get up in the morning every day and call out his name and I say, thank you, Jesus, for another day. You ever get up and you just feel like, oh, that hurts? Mm -hmm. Oh, that hurt, yeah. We say, thank you, Jesus, that you give me another day. Even though I'm in pain, it hurts. Thank you for for giving me another day. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, Romans 10, 13, calling for help. Number seven, salvation is as simple as the trust of a child, Matthew 18, two through three. And Jesus called a little child unto him and said unto him in the midst of them, and said, Verily, I say unto you, except you be converted and become as a little as little children, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Salvation is as simple as that. That's why if we can't come as a little child, we can't come. We're not gonna make it. We gotta have childlike faith, childlike trust in our Savior in order to be saved. And last of all, number eight, salvation is as simple as believing in Jesus Christ. John 6, 47, verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. 
John 11, 25 through 26, Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever believeth, liveth and believeth in me, shall never die. You know, Martha and Mary, they loved Lazarus. and Jesus delayed getting there by a couple of days. Love delayed. But Jesus wept. But not because he was dead, but more because of their unbelief. And they thought, well, yeah, we know that in the last day, Jesus said, no, I am the resurrection and the life. I am. In, in John 6, 47, if you didn't catch it, I just want to repeat that. Jesus said, verily, verily, I say, he, is, he, he wants to repeat verily, verily, because it's important that you pay attention. Is, I say unto you that he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. Did you recognize when you read the scriptures that there are times when the Bible says, believe in him and believe on him? And if you look up, what is the difference believing in him and believing on him? Well, even Satan believes in him, but he can't believe on him because Satan can't be saved. Impossible for him or his demons to ever be saved. But we're told to believe in Jesus Christ. In other words, to know that he is God, that he is the son of God, to know this in believing, but also to let that drop from intellectual knowledge into our heart 18 inches and moreover, as we believe even there, but believe on him because in John 11, 25, 26, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. There he said, in me. But then in verse 26, and whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. But he said in John 6, 47, believeth on me. And there are other places as well where the Jesus says to believe on him. Do you believe on him? You believe in him, but do you believe on him? Because we can believe in him and never be saved. But if you believe in him and then you believe on him, that just simply means you are totally giving over yourself and your trust and your faith to God because you're believing on him for everything. You're believing on him for your salvation. Not just believing in the fact that, yeah, there was one time there was a Jesus that lived and he, he died on a cross. And you kind of leave it there but you accept by believing on him that atoning sacrifice into your own heart and life. And so then Romans 10, 17, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Faith is trusting what the word of God says and believing on him. It all comes down to the question in John eleven twenty six: 26, do you believe this? And in closing this morning, your response will determine your eternal destiny either heaven or hell, and you can't stumble over this simplicity of salvation. And I may be preaching to the choir right now. I don't know. Only God knows your heart. God is the one that knows all of our heart. But in closing, in Psalm 103, 11 through 13, the psalmist said, For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us through the simplicity of salvation and accepting his atoning work, of course. Verse 13, like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. And when we fear him, we must fear him in love because that fear is not like I'm scared of him, I'm afraid of him, but it's that reverence of him that awe of who he is, the awe of what he did 2,000 years ago on the cross of Calvary. So inquiring minds want to know just well what is meant by the heavens are, are uh, above, high above the earth, the understanding of the heavens, the totality of the universe outside of this earth, the universe outside of this earth. They are approximately 46 billion light years higher than the earth. In fact, the heavens are so high above the earth that human beings cannot possibly see everything in them. We serve a mighty big God. Can you imagine that? I just give you some homework. 
go home and look uh, online. You won't find it there, but you'll find it here. What one light year is. When we're talking 40, what, 45 billion light years above the earth. All the heavens, the universe, the expanse. In other words, God's love is so great that we can in no way measure it. It is limitless. We cannot try to put it into words, but soon realize our words are way too small for that. God's love is immeasurably high, and this great love is steadfast, unchanging, consistent, and dependable. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that's within me. And then the next part of that verse says, As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. This is great mercy not getting what we deserve. When we get saved, every sin that we've ever committed is gone, washed away, and he, he puts it out there as far as the east is from the west. How far is the east from the west? Well, I'm glad you asked. If you get in a jet with unlimited fuel and start heading east, you can continue going east forever and never meet west. In other words, the phrase, as far as the east is from the west, would mean our sin and God would be infinitely apart, never to come together again. There is no better analogy to describe the absolute act of mercy through forgiveness that God gives his people than to know that our sins, our transgressions against God, our past ones. Now, anything in the future will be there, and we've got to deal with that, but he cast those as far as the east is from the West, never to be remembered by him anymore. Would you stand? Thank you, Lord Jesus, for the simplicity of salvation, for the simplicity of the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Oh, thank you, Lord. And today, God... You've been dealing with some hearts. Some people will run. Well, heads are bowed. Eyes are closed. If you're here today and you're not sure of your salvation. I, I, again, Brent said it earlier, the greatest miracle. The greatest miracle is, is salvation. Thank you, Jesus. If you're not sure of your salvation, well, I'm seeing who I need to pray for and the Holy Spirit recognizes, just lift your hand and say, I'm not sure about my salvation. I've made it too difficult. Just raise your hand real quick. Is there one? Is there one? God speaking to your heart. Is there one here today that would raise your hand and say, I know. This is not a matter of not being sure. I know, I'm sure that I need to be saved. Would you raise your hand? Is there one? Is there one? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. If you're a Christian today, pray. If you know you're saved, pray. Okay. I thank you, Lord, that everyone here has made that commitment to you to be a Christian, has prayed a sinner's prayer with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength, and they've given their life to you. We've all done that, but Lord, we're not perfect. We've not attained. We've not already arrived. So, with your heads lifted up, your eyes open, and everybody looking as we close. How many of you would now say, though, well, when you got to that part about those disciplines, when you got to that part about the Bible and about prayer, about witnessing, 
on and on there. There's where I need to apply myself. There's where I need to apply more effort. And I need to cultivate those good habits, spiritual things that will help me to grow spiritually. If that's you, now I know if that's you and me, raise your hand. Raise your hand. You need to cultivate those disciplines. Okay. Uh, not everybody raised their hand. A lot of you did. And I'll be praying for you. You pray for me that these things will be cultivated more and more in our life. And pray for you that didn't raise your hand, that you'll have a desire for those things to be cultivated in your life. Amen? God's good. He loves you. But there's no way you're going to know how it is you should walk with and for the Lord without the road map, without the guidebook. His word is so, so very important. After all, the same, the same word, the same book we have with us today in this house, Pastor Vance has 10 hours ahead of us in a place called Morocco. And the gospel and the simplicity of the gospel or whatever it's preaching is being shared with people who need to know the Lord probably for the very first time in their life. And as we close in prayer, Let's pray that that'll happen, that it's already happened in two services and whatever else he's got to do this week with ministry, that people will come to Christ in Morocco and that people will come to Christ also here in America. Father, as we close today, I thank you, Jesus, that the people said with unison there that, that uh, most, most of them know Jesus as their personal Savior and also most of them are doing their best to cultivate and grow in these spiritual gifts and